So this next section is about using the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate um, definite integrals. So one way to evaluate definite integrals is, remember, thinking about them as signed area. There are some um, integrands that really this is the only way that we're going to be able to evaluate the definite integral. So this particular integrand I hope you recognize as a semicircle with a radius of 3. So this part of it is a semicircle, radius of 3, and then shifted up 2 units. So the center would be at 0, 0, but it's really at 0, 2 because it's been shifted up 2 units. If I would like to find the area under that semicircle, between that semicircle and the x-axis, then really what I'm trying to find is I'm trying to find this area here, which is a quarter of a circle because I'm going from 0 to 3, but then I'm also trying to find the area with that rectangle under it. So, um, so I have really two different areas that I'm looking at. I'm looking at the area of the quarter circle plus the area of the rectangle. If I um, look at the area of the semicircle, well, the quarter circle, the radius is 3, so it would be 3 squared times pi and then divided by 4. And then the area of the rectangle, well, it's 2 tall and 3 wide, so the area of the rectangle would be 2 times 3 or 6. So anyway, this would be 9 pi over 4 plus 6, and that's how I would find that integral. Um, if I were going to do the second one, I'm looking at the area between negative 1 and 5, so I'm looking at the, this part which is above the x-axis and kind of a wacky shape. And then this part, which is a triangle that's below the x-axis. This is a 2 by 2 triangle, so it has an area of 2, but since it's below the x-axis, its signed area would be negative 2. Um, and then this looks like a trapezoid which is, has a base length of 1 and another one of 3. So the average height would be 2 times a, um, 2. Oh, the, the, sorry, the base, this would be 2 and this would be 3. So it would have an average base of 2.5 times a height of 1. And then the other one, the other triangle here is 3 by 3. So divided by 2 would be um, 9 halves. Um, so then that area would be um, 2.5 plus 4.5 minus 2, or that signed area would be that. So that would be 7 minus 2, or 5. Um, I had these graphs already in here for you, but if I didn't have the graphs, I hope you agree that you would be able to graph 3 minus the absolute value of x, and you would be able to graph that semicircle as well. Um, but here's the challenge. Sometimes we're going to have integrands that even if we graph them carefully, we don't have area formulas. If we graph the sine function, this shape doesn't have a nice area formula that is associated with it. That shape is not quite a semicircle, so we can't use pi r squared divided by 2 for that shape. Similarly, for this parabola, we have this kind of semicircle-ish shape, but not a semicircle, and then this triangle-ish shape, but not a triangle. So the way we evaluate these integrands is going to be very different from the way we evaluate integrands that we can graph and find the area for. So the, the tool we're going to use for this type of integral is we are going to use the second part of the fundamental theorem. And what the second part of the fundamental theorem says is that if you want to evaluate an integral from a to b of a function, then all you have to do is find any antiderivative of your function and evaluate it at b and a and subtract. And I'm going to prove this theorem 
but it relies really heavily on the first part of the fundamental theorem. So what I'm going to do to begin is I'm going to define big F. Big F can be any antiderivative of little f. So I'm going to let my big F be the integral from c to x of little f. Um, if that's true, then I hope you agree because of the first part of the fundamental theorem that if I take the derivative of this capital F, I get, oh, and I wrote this wrong. These parts should be t's, right? If I take the derivative of big F, then I get little f as my derivative. So that means that big F is an antiderivative. There's nothing special about it, I just made it up, but I know that it's an antiderivative of little f because when I take the derivative of big F, I get little f. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, figure out what f of b minus f of a is. Ooh. So if this is my definition of f, then when I plug in b, I get the integral from c to b. And if I plug in a, I get the integral from c to a. Now I'm going to use additive, I'm going to use um, the limits of integration are, I'm going to switch those around. So I'm going to go from, um, I'm going to change this to addition because I'm changing the sign and I'm going to change the limits of integration around. And I'm allowed to do that because if I change the limits of integration, it changes the sign of my function, um, of my integral. And then what I notice is that I'm doing the integral from a to c plus the integral from c to b. So that's going to be equal to the integral from a to b. And that's exactly what we said it would be. So we just got from here to here. So um, that's the proof of the fundamental theorem. It relies really heavily on knowing that, oh, this is what antiderivative means. And here's an antiderivative that I made up and it works. There's nothing special about the antiderivative that I made up. So um, this c didn't have to be c. It could have been 12. It could have been a, uh, m. It doesn't matter what that limit of integration is as long as big F is an antiderivative of little f, then this will work. So the challenge will be figuring out an antiderivative to use. So we're going to go back to these examples of um, integrals that we can't just graph to find the area. So instead what we're going to use is the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And our process as we're doing this is we're saying, well, I know that the derivative is sine. So I'm trying to think of what function that would be before I took a derivative that gave me sine. Um, and maybe you're thinking, well, it's cosine, right? Well, the derivative of cosine though is negative sine. So it's going to be negative cosine because then the derivative of that would be positive sine. So then if we're going to do this antiderivative, we would say, and this is the notation that I use. So we think about what is the antiderivative function. So we do so. Okay, so that's cosine of x. And then we straighten out our integral sign and put our limits of integration back in, in those spots. We've already done the antiderivative, so we don't have an integral sign anymore, but we have not plugged in our numbers yet. So now we're going to plug in our numbers. Everything's going crazy. So our numbers would be negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of zero. Cosine of pi is negative one, so negative negative one would be one minus negative one. So this integral is two. That means again that if I graph out the sine function, the area under one bump of that sine function is two.
All right. Um, so for this next problem, I would encourage you to pause the video and see if you can come up with the antiderivative yourself, remembering that if we take the derivative of whatever that is, we get x squared minus 3x. So I hope you said to yourself, well, x squared, that must have been an x cubed function before we took the derivative. But if I took the derivative of x cubed, that would be 3x squared. So I'm going to divide that by 3 in order to make that work out. And then 3x, well, the derivative of x squared would be 2x. So I actually want this to be 3 over 2. You can check that by taking a derivative, making sure that you get x squared minus 3x. And then I'm straightening out my integral sign and showing that I'm going to evaluate that from 0 to 4. Now I'm going to plug in the 4. So 4 cubed would be 64 over 3 minus 3 times 16 would be 48 over 2 and minus 0, because when I plug in 0 to that function, I just get 0. Um, so this would be 24, and this would be 21 and a fourth. So this would be negative 2 and 3 quarters. And I'm going to go back to this picture. Um, this is the parabola that looks like this from our picture before. Most of that area is below the x-axis, and then there's also some bit that was above the x-axis. So it makes sense. I'm going to go back to this picture. It makes sense that the answer to that integral would be negative, because more of the area is below the x-axis. Here are two more examples that I'd encourage you to try, and then I'll go through them um, after you've tried them. So the first one, the function is e to the x. What was it before we take the derivative? Well, e to the x is that function that is its own derivative. So this time, it doesn't look like I'm doing anything, but I'm really finding the antiderivative, which is e to the x, and I'm going to evaluate it from 0 to 3. So then if I plug in 3, I get e to the 3 minus e to the 0, so this integral evaluates to e cubed minus 1. And again, what that means is the area between 0 and 3 of the exponential function is e cubed minus 1. Um, and then this last one, we have 1 over x. What gives you 1 over x as a derivative? I hope you remember that would be natural log of x. So if I evaluate natural log of x at e and 1, that means I'm saying natural log of e minus natural log of 1. Well, natural log of e would be 1, because that's the exponent of e that gives me e. And natural log of 1 would be 0. So this would be 1. All right, so that's how you use antiderivatives to evaluate integrals. Good luck.